morning, Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm James Barton in Washington. Today is Friday, May 12, and here are some of the stories we are covering. The UN Human Rights Council plans to examine alleged human rights abuses in the Sudan conflict. We were also calling for the members of the Human Rights Council to establish an investigative mechanism that is going to complement the work of the already existing mechanisms on Sudan, including that of the designated expert. South Sudan authorities hand back over nine abductees to Uganda. Western countries consider designating Russia's Wagner Group as a terrorist organization. The presidential and parliamentary primaries of Ghana's main opposition party, the National Democratic Congress, will take place tomorrow Saturday despite challenges. As a political party, we have a very robust delegate system. And the delegate list that we have currently it's and, and a Somali journalist reflect on his time in prison. Those stories plus something Omali sports are coming up on Daybreak Africa. The UN Human Rights Council says it will examine carefully alleged human rights abuses being committed during the Sudan conflict between the army led by General Abdel Fattah al burhan and the paramilitary rapid support forces, the RSF, led by General Mohamed Hamdan Dagalo. At an emergency session on Thursday, the council called for the immediate cessation of hostilities with no preconditions and for all parties to return to a transition to a civilian-led government. This comes as peace talks continue in Saudi Arabia amid continuing fighting in Khartoum. Abdullahi Hassan is an Amnesty International researcher for Somalia and Sudan. He tells me that while Amnesty International welcomes Thursday's developments, it would have preferred that the UN Human Rights Council establish an investigative mechanism on Sudan to complement existing processes. Amnesty International, uh, a month ago and actually a few weeks ago, we were calling for a special session of the Human Rights Council to convene, uh, which we really welcomed. Uh, we welcome all the states that ensured that session was convened today. But we were not only calling for the convening of the session, we were also calling for the members of the Human Rights Council to establish an investigative mechanism that is going to complement the work of the already existing mechanisms on Sudan, including that of the designated expert. But unfortunately, we were not able to get that uh, mechanism because many states were unwilling to support such a mechanism, although the resolution was passed, narrowly passed, to be honest, which is uh, very discouraging for the Sudanese people. But we welcome this initial step, and we hope going forward the Human Rights Council in its subsequent sessions will consider to establish an investigative mechanism to ensure international human rights uh, humanitarian law violations committed by the parties to the ongoing conflict is properly documented, evidence is preserved, and such a mechanism will be able to come up with recommendations for accountability and justice and reparations for victims of the violations committed in Sudan. What sort of human rights abuses does Amnesty International think are being violated in the Sudan conflict? Thank you. At Amnesty International, we continue to document and receive testimonies from uh, people in Sudan, including attacks on civilians. Most of the people uh, we interviewed told us their relatives were attacked, were killed uh, by either stray bullets or through air strikes. A number of people told us their houses have been destroyed. So we are seeing a situation where civilian objects are being targeted, civilians are getting killed. We are also documenting massive displacement of people from Sudan. Most of them are becoming internally displaced, and many, many others are trying to leave the country and are becoming refugees in neighboring countries. The most horrific thing we are hearing is that so many people are trapped inside their houses and are unable to get food, water, and other basic necessities. Also, uh, the sick are unable to go to hospitals because some hospitals have been attacked and healthcare workers have been threatened and some of them have been attacked. Uh, so there is a health crisis on top of the ongoing conflict in the country which really makes the uh, situation very bad. These violations are not only taking place in Khartoum, but they are also taking place in the 
preference in other parts of the country, including in Darfur. Abdullahi, thank you so much. A pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, James. Thank you so much. Abdullahi Hassan is Amnesty International researcher for Somalia and Sudan. He was speaking with us from the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. South Sudan authorities have returned over nine Ugandan nationals who were abducted by an armed group during an attack on a village in Moyo district along Uganda's northern border. They were handed over by Kajo Keji County Commissioner Fanuel Dumo, who condemned the attack and abduction. Catherine Nambi reports from Kampala. The Ugandan nationals were seized during an attack by armed South Sudan youths who raided Gwede village in Moyo district, claiming they had settled on land belonging to South Sudan. The land in question has for long been at the center of contention between the two countries with each, claiming the land is located within their boundaries. South Sudan authorities in Kajokeji County rescued the abductees following an engagement with Ugandan authorities. During a meeting at Afoji Customs, at the Uganda-South Sudan border, the commissioner for Kajokeji County, Fanuel Domo, said all those behind the attack and kidnapping will be arrested and punished. It's a very unfortunate situation. We do not allow this thing to continue because it may escalate the situation. When we have a cordial relation, we don't want to injure one another. I think still it's not too late. We'll continue to pursue it on your side and the other side. The law is going to pursue all those involved. The Ugandan delegation who received the abductees was led by the Moyo District Resident Commissioner Gowa Goffin. He asked South Sudan officials to handle groups of disorderly youth and to help foster mutual cooperation between the two neighboring countries. When I heard about my people who were taken across, I was concerned. I called several times, but finally you have done everything within your means to have them safe and alive. This is good news for all of us, that we've not lost any life. Even if there were issues, damages on their body here, and that can be managed. So I want to ask you, uh, Commissioner and your team, let us ensure that we don't lose any lives. The attack on the Ugandan village left about 400 people homeless. More than 100 grass-thatched houses were touched on both sides of the border. Livestock, food, mobile phones and money were looted from residents who fled for their safety and are now sheltered at a Uganda army camp. Uganda's President Yoweri Museveni and South Sudan's President Salva Kiel have discussed the issue of the contested land and agreed the border communities can till the farmland without either nation claiming ownership until new boundaries are finalized. Disputes over the land have continued among communities, but there are no signs that the demarcation would be done soon. This is Catherine Nambi for VOA News in Kampala. The U.S. envoy to South Africa on Thursday accused the country of covertly providing arms to Russia. Ambassador Rubin Brigitte told a media briefing that the U.S. believes weapons and ammunition were loaded onto a Russian freighter that docked at a Cape Town naval base in December. But President Cyril Ramaphosa's office denies the allegation, saying it was disappointing that the ambassador had, in his words, adopted a counterproductive public posture. Spokesperson Vincent Manguenya said the remarks undermined the spirit of cooperation and partnership between the two nations. South Africa has refused to condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which has largely isolated Moscow on the international stage. Britain is reportedly preparing to designate the Wagner Group, a Russian private army that is deeply involved in the invasion of Ukraine as a terrorist organization. The European Union and the United States are debating similar moves. That would put the group in the same bracket as Islamic State and Al-Qaeda. Henry Richwell reports from London. Russia's Wagner Group, a private army, is spearheading much of the fighting for the Ukrainian city of Bakhmut. Many of its mercenaries have been recruited from Russian prisons. Wagner is blamed for widespread atrocities in Ukraine, torturing and killing prisoners of war and civilians, including children, accusations it denies. Members of the group, including its leader, Yevgeny Prigozhin, are already subject to U.S., European Union and British sanctions. Wagner operates closely with the Russian state. It opened this military technology center in St. Petersburg last year. 
Britain has been building a legal case to designate Wagner as a terrorist organization, according to the Times of London newspaper. Belonging to or promoting Wagner or even displaying its logo would become a criminal offense. Tanya Mera is from the International Center for Counterterrorism in The Hague. It may deter companies maybe uh, to do business uh, with Wagner, but it's doubtful what effect it will have because I mean, uh, Wagner is getting their financial resources not so much uh, from uh, Europe, but uh, from uh, their activities that they are carrying out, their legal activities in Africa. So. What could be the benefits? Yeah, it is maybe more symbolic. Wagner mercenaries have operated in Syria and several African countries, including Libya, the Central African Republic, Mali and Sudan, typically offering governments security services in return for access to mineral wealth and support for Russia's geopolitical aims. In March 2022, around 300 civilians died in an attack on the Malian town of Moura, which was then controlled by jihadist forces. Speaking at the time, witnesses accused Malian forces and Russian Wagner fighters of summary executions, which Mali denied. Amadou, who ran a stool in Moura and declined to give his family name, told Reuters the Malian army came with a lot of white men. We can call them Russians. They didn't understand one another. They took 15 to 20 people. They lined them up about 100 metres from us. They made them kneel down and they shot them. The French parliament voted Tuesday to designate the Wagner Group as a terrorist entity in a non-binding resolution, adding pressure on the European Union to take action. In Washington, a bipartisan group of lawmakers is pushing for the United States to classify Wagner as a foreign terrorist organization. The U.S. Attorney General said in March he would not object to the move. In the U.S., if they would be designated as a terrorist group, it would have the most far-reaching consequences as anyone who would be providing material support uh, to the Wagner Group could also uh, face criminal prosecution. So that would mean that uh, states uh, or certain government officials from African states who would be engaging with um, Uh, Wagner uh, could be liable for criminal prosecutions. The Times report said Britain could designate Wagner as a terrorist group within weeks. The British government declined to comment. Henry Ridgewell, VOA News, London. The show of Ghana's main opposition party, the National Democratic Congress, NDC, says the party's presidential and parliamentary primaries will take place on Saturday tomorrow as planned. This comes after Kwabena Dufour, one of the presidential aspiring, filed an injunction with the Electoral Commission seeking a postponement of the primaries due to alleged irregularities in the party's voter register. Ghana holds presidential presidential elections in 2024. The Electoral Commission said this week that it will not supervise the NDC primaries until the legal question is resolved. James Gunu is the NDC Volta Region Secretary. He tells me that the party has a robust and tested electoral system. The briefings are far advanced for the presidential and parliamentary primaries on Saturday. And in my region, the Volta Region, We are expecting 20,721 delegates to vote in the presidential primaries across the 18 constituencies in the voter region. So we have set in place all the security arrangements. We had a meeting with the Ghana Police Service in the region yesterday. Mr. Guno, the reason I'm calling you because I read that the Elections Commission is not going to supervise these primaries, apparently because of a complaint filed by one of the presidential candidates, uh, Dr. Kwabina Dufour, that the, issue, the primaries should be postponed because of some uh, irregularities that he complained about. What can you tell us? Yeah, Dr. Dufour complained about delegate list, but as a political party, we have a very robust delegate system and the delegate list that we have currently is tried and tested. We use this delegate list 
for our constituency elections last year. We used the same delegate list for our uh, regional elections. We used the same delegate list for our national elections. So there is no problem with our delegate list. However, before you even go to an election or even campaign as an aspirant, you should know those who are supposed to vote for you because you have to carry your message to them. Dr. Kobra Dupont and all other aspirants in this context have traveled across the length and breadth of this country campaigning to delegate that they should vote for them on the 13th of May. That is coming Saturday. So let me ask you, the fact that the Electoral Commission has said that it will not supervise the election, will this decision affect the result of the primary? I strongly believe that when the parties have agreed, the Electoral Commission will have no option than to help us because even though it's their duty, they are not doing it for free. The party has actually negotiated with the Electoral Commission and whatever cost that is involved is being borne by the National Democratic Congress. James Gunu is the Volta Region Secretary of Ghana's Opposition National Democratic Congress, the NDC party. He was speaking with me from Ghana's Volta Region. Last year, Somali journalist Abdallah Ahmed Mumi told VOA he could not travel out of Somalia to be with his family in Kenya because authorities had confiscated his passport. Mumi is the Secretary General of the Somali Journalist Syndicate, an umbrella organization for the country's media. He says he was detained in October last year after the syndicate criticized the government's directive regarding coverage of security operations against the terrorist group Al-Shabaab. Now he has been able to join his family in Kenya and has written about his prison experiences. Abdullah tells me that he heard harrowing stories from some of the prisoners, including the use of electrocutions and beatings as interrogation techniques. The detention was just like another very harrowing incident in Somalia when you could meet or hear people from different backgrounds who were detained uh, who were also tortured, beaten badly. Women who might tell you that they were raped and they have no contact with their families. Children as young as 15 who are in detention and who told me that their families did not know about their situation. All of these atrocities taking place in the capital Mogadishu and these well prisoners are continuously committed by the members of Somali security forces, uh, including the police and the national intelligence who continuously receive support from the Western countries. You mentioned the problem of impunity. You say here, I am now reunited with my family in Nairobi, but I am angry. Why are you angry? I am angry because I feel the impunity still goes on. All of these attacks and the threats against my life have been committed by powerful people in the Somali government, federal government, and they are continuously targeting other members of the community, including journalists, women, human rights defenders, and they are not held accountable. You know, Abdallah, I've never been to jail, but uh, based on what I know, I read about jail, it must be a very lonely place. Well, how did you keep your spirit in, in jail? Very difficult, James, when you don't have anything to eat, when you don't have water to drink, when you think that you might be dying in the next 20 minutes. I was in an underground cell where I lost breathing uh, indeed, and I was really, really prepared to die, and I was thinking of my family. I started to pray out of this situation. Imagine people who have some kind of sickness, like blood pressure, who are diabetic, who have been continuously put into this situation. Imagine people who are elderly and have nothing uh, to do uh, but to wait uh, to die. I witnessed once one of the inmates who died inside my cell. I was with another 41 inmates in this small cell, and there was no drinking water. There is no running water at all. 
you will wait and wait for days to get something to wash your body. That was the situation. It was very, very terrible. What do you do for entertainment? Uh, do you watch television? Do you listen to radio? What, what is there? No entertainment at all, but James, I can tell you, the only means we had in the prison cell was the radio, FM radio station. I was lucky to listen to Voice of America, especially in the morning when I woke up, the Daybreak Africa program, I could hear James, your voice. Thank you, James, for this program. I can tell you, this is one of the most listened local programs in Somalia, those who speak English during the morning. So I will say to you, keep up for this, but people would like to hear more local content, James, in this program. Abella, thank you so much. Uh, a pleasure speaking with you, and uh, good that you are reunited with your family. Thank you, James, and keep up the good work. Abdallah Akmai Mumi is the Secretary General of the Somali Journalist Syndicate, an umbrella organization for media in Somalia. He was speaking with me from Kenya's capital, Nairobi.